Daily around Australia, members of a small religious sect gather for prayer, Bible readings or Holy Communion. They're a Christian congregation of simple, God-fearing folk. Very nice people and very, very sincere. Um, people who I think are very genuine in what they believe and what they want to do. These are the exclusive brethren. They believe they're chosen by God and they long for the rapture when the saints on earth will be separated from the rest. The rapture is a teaching that there will be a time when all of uh, those who are Christian and alive uh, at a particular time will be swept up into uh, the next life uh, and uh, left behind will be those who are not pure. Members of this sect are forbidden to vote or to socialize with those outside the fellowship. But quietly, brethren have campaigned hard in elections, supporting conservative parties and family values. Tonight, Four Corners opens the doors on the brethren, revealing the burden placed on those inside the sect and the price extracted from those who leave. You still keep those letters? I do. I just love to see their handwriting. Folded away from the public's gaze in Australia, the exclusive brethren live their daily lives by the scriptures. They say the Bible tells them to separate themselves from evil. Separation, they say, is as old as time itself. The scriptures from beginning to end teach separation. They're a group that take very seriously the need to withdraw from the world and to keep from being tainted with the world. The Brethren claim 40,000 members worldwide, around half of whom live in Australia and New Zealand. The world leader is a Sydney accountant called Bruce Hales. He's known as the Man of God, or the Elect Vessel. The Man of God is very much a figure of substantial power because uh, he uh, is the ultimate authority on the interpretation of scripture within the group and uh, uh, plays that role. Brethren families take their lead from the Man of God they won't send their children to university and television, radio, personal computers and mobile phones are forbidden. In common with other fundamentalist Christian groups, the Brethren practice excommunication. Anyone who defies the universal leader risks being excommunicated. By disagreeing with the man of God, you may indeed be uh, in, in, engaging in a kind of... Uh, deviance within the group that the group can't tolerate. And that's what excommunication is about. Brethren are banned from voting by their leaders. That, though, hasn't stopped the church from campaigning in elections in several different countries, focusing on family values and a conservative agenda. They've claimed that it's only been individual members, uh, but the material that these individual members have produced in the political arena has been very similar in Australia, New Zealand, uh, Canada, uh, even in the USA. As the Brethren have become politically more visible, Four Corners has been approached by former members concerned that the real story of the sect's family values isn't being told. Get out of here, I'll boot the whole thing over. Four Corners set out to uncover that story, but it wasn't easy. The Brethren wouldn't be interviewed, and their attitude to being filmed is hostile, as we discovered when we were quietly filming in a public Perth street. We just realised that you're a camera crew, so we're just giving you crap. So who called you up here? Who called you up here? Are you opposers? Are you supporters? Are supporters of what? Hey, just by the way, I'll just warn you in five minutes, if you don't get off... Have you got a fear of the government of God? Are you believers? You're threatening us? We no, are not, not threatening a, a you. Believers. We are not threatening you. You what? are threatening us. No, we're not threatening you. Yes, you are. What are you doing here, way? you poor cunt? Yes, you are. Do in you believe in God? You. Do you believe in God? Get a real job. In God? Yes, wage, I do. Mate. I do believe in God. <laughs> Waste your fuel, mate. 
poor cunts. The Brethren's leaders wouldn't appear on this programme, nor would they allow any families within the church to be filmed or interviewed. Former Brethren say you need to know the history of the movement in order to understand it now. The exclusive Brethren sect has its roots in 19th century Dublin, where a new fundamentalist Protestant movement was born. Its leader was an aristocratic clergyman, J.N. Darby. It came about in Ireland in the 1800s with John Darby particularly, um, who decided that uh, they wanted to, to study the Bible and take things uh, more seriously with an emphasis on the evil of the world and separating from the world uh, to live a great, with a greater dedication for God. Its members were known early on as the Plymouth Brethren, but soon there were two distinct breakaway groups, the Open Brethren and the more hardline Exclusives. Joy Nason grew up in a Brethren household in post-war England. In the early days, I didn't think it was anything very abnormal. Was it good? Was it, was it a, a loving, close community? Yes. When she was 10, her father decided they should emigrate to Australia. But like many girls growing up in a society that was becoming freer, she felt hemmed in. We were much better off and we had much more comfortable family life. But things started to change, um, things started to get more strict and I started to feel um, embarrassed about belonging to this group of, of brethren. Embarrassed for what reason? Because I, I wasn't allowed to go to the pictures, for instance. We didn't have radio. And uh, I felt, I started to feel different. Then, as now, women and girls in the church were expected to be subservient to their husbands and fathers. I'll never forget um, later on, um, when I was a young married woman, the brethren coming to me and uh, suggesting that I should only speak one-tenth of what my husband did. <laughs> in New Zealand, Nairi Thomas also grew up in a brethren family. It wasn't really until we start, I started school that I realised I was different. And even then, way back um, over 60 years ago, it wasn't probably so much different to a basic fundamentalist Christian family. The end of the 1950s proved a turning point in Brethren history. American Big Jim Taylor, who'd taken over the leadership from his father James Taylor Sr., told his fellow Brethren that they had to separate completely from the outside world. From then on, Brethren families weren't allowed to socialise or even eat with anyone outside the movement. That included close relatives. Prior to the 60s, we were able to see grandparents and uncles and aunties who were on the outside. And we used to really cherish those times when we could see those members of the family. But um, after the early 60s, when what they call the eating issue came along, when we weren't allowed to eat or drink, or, um, socialise with other people, that became very, very hard on our relatives. It meant that we as a family had to sever our links with relations who weren't amongst the brethren because my father wasn't born amongst the brethren, he was a Baptist. So that was traumatic. Uh, huge heartbreak. I mean, wives directed in meetings not to go back to their spouse who was not with the brethren. Um, it was just a time of complete devastation for families, just ripped apart. The 1960s brought other changes. The man of God was fond of a drop of whiskey and expected his fellow brethren to drink it too. Even though the brethren would not admit this, he was an alcoholic. I can remember um, being instructed to um, to provide whisky at meal times when we had visitors, and we had visitors um, very often. Uh, I can remember being um, forced to drink whisky because if I didn't, I was hiding something. 
other eccentric rules were introduced. There's a line in the Bible that says, without are the dogs. So someone decided no pets. Sounds just crazy. Well, no, no one questioned it. That's the point. If they said you had to get rid of your pets, you got rid of your pets. It was also a decade of multiple accusations and mass confessions. Children were shamed in public, as Nairi Thomas discovered when she was challenged about her behaviour in front of hundreds of brethren. They came to me because they'd heard that there was something between me and, um, and my cousin. And when they asked me if I'd committed fornication, I says, oh, yeah, I suppose so, because I knew I'd kissed and cuddled my cousin down in the bushes down behind his house. I was put in my room on my own um, uh, for several days and just sort of um, fed through the door um, until it was my turn to go up in front of the, of the church of about, probably about five or 600 people. And nobody bothered to come and ask me if I knew what they were talking about. <laughs> and I, mean, I can laugh about it now, but um, it wasn't very funny at the time. How old were you then? I was 15, going on 16. So what was it like for a 15-year-old girl being hauled in front of a meeting of several hundred older men and women and, and yeah. grilled, essentially? Very, very, very frightening, very frightening. And um, uh, it's something that I will, I will never forget. In the frenzy of confessions, adults too confess to sins of many kinds. I have heard people confess to molesting children. And were those acts reported to the police? Definitely not. No, they were forgiven. If the person was sorry, if the person showed enough contrition, the brethren forgave them. In 1968, Joy Nason left the church of her own accord. She worked as a secretary in the city and wanted to live her life in the world outside the brethren. The decision had a devastating effect on her mother, as she discovered when she returned home to collect the rest of her belongings. She opened the door, and I could barely recognise her. I just said, what's wrong? And she said, I've been fasting to get you back. That was typical of my mother. She was a very strong believer in, in God, very strong believer in the, in the religion. She thought if she fasted, I'd come back. She thought God would bring me back. And so no, no food or water had passed her mouth for three weeks. She was, it was a terrible sight. Did that make you feel guilty? Oh, yes. And how long did this guilt last? <laughs> I, the, you carry the guilt with you forever. Once it was clear that she never would return, the brethren excommunicated Joy Nason. She was, to use their term, withdrawn from. They brought in what they called dead separation. So therefore, if anyone left, you had to view them as dead. Now, I do know other religions do that also. I'm not saying they're the only ones. But if you're unfortunate enough to be brought up in, in them, and if you escape, then you know that you are treated as dead. Bastards. You bastards. Mum. Scott. Mum. Scott. Mum. Scott. Mum. Scott. Mum. You never had it like that. You nut. In 1970, Jim Taylor, who'd been the subject of increasing press and public criticism, cemented his reputation as a man of God who'd supped too much on whiskey. A meeting in Aberdeen, Scotland, descended into chaos as he ranted drunkenly at his fellow brethren. He took meetings in Aberdeen uh, about the middle of the year and it just became a farce, basically. Um, it wasn't ministry. Even ungodlier was the man of God's behaviour at night time. For a number of nights, uh, he had a lady come into his room who was someone else's wife, and she would stay there for a long, long time. 
They actually walked in and the lady was naked. I find it so hard to believe that the brethren in there are so gullible that they can actually believe the story that they were told. What were they told? Well, they were told that, that, um, that nothing happened, that she was in there um, uh, ministering to him by washing his feet and drying his feet with the, with the hair and this sort of... And I think that's just garbage. Obviously, what the man was doing was committing adultery. The evidence was very, very clear and, and obvious. The moral hypocrisy exposed by the Aberdeen incident shook the church to its foundations, and as a result, some 8,000 brethren left the fellowship. Jim Taylor died the same year, and the mantle of man of God passed to a North Dakota pig farmer called James Symington. Ron Fawkes, himself a former leader of the exclusive brethren in Australia, remembers Symington well. In his earlier life, he had been a quiet, unassuming person. And once he got control and had this total power over 50,000 people, I mean, he just became a, a monster. It's almost as if the power he had just corrupted him. As overall leader of the Brethren, James Symington received huge donations of cash from his faithful followers around the world. The um, vast amounts of money uh, handed over referred to as, as gifts to particularly to the leading, leading men. Now that money amounts in the course of a year to millions, all going untaxed. Ron Fawkes alleges that when James Symington was leader, he sidestepped customs regulations by transporting large sums of cash across international borders. The amount of money that was transferred through interstate and international borders was just absolutely horrific. And I myself was given wads of money to carry for this person across British, Canadian, American things. I hate to think of what would have happened if I'd been you know, arrested or caught. Was that lawful? It was totally illegal. Totally illegal. How much money are you talking about? Tens and tens and tens of thousands of dollars in cash. And this was at his request? Absolutely. See that vacuum cleaner there? Yeah. Just pick that up and bring it in here. Because it has to go into this office. Brethren believe in the duty to provide for their families. And networks of small family businesses thrive, ensuring that there's virtually no unemployment in the fellowship. They are economically engaged so that they tend to be comfortably middle class in their economic situation. They would also be ready to assist each other uh, should uh, need arise so that they would have an internal form of welfare that one could rely on uh, and depend on for cradle to grave kind of support. We have to wire into that point there. But many ex-brethren believe the church has lost sight of its basic founding Christian principles. The church would be very wealthy because of the property that it owns. How much, I don't know, but I mean, it you know, runs into hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of millions of dollars. It's grown rich, need of nothing. They don't even need Christ anymore. They've got their leader. All they have to do really is, is do what they're told, conform, and uh, try to be as successful as possible, materially. Jesus told someone to, to um, sell all that he had and give it to the poor. Um, you, you don't see that sort of thing happening in there. I mean, uh, we don't need to be materialistic. I mean, as, as a Quaker now, um, I'm probably the least materialistic than I've ever been in my life. <laughs> Nairi Thomas married her husband Dennis when they were both in the exclusive Brethren. It turned into a lifelong love affair, which survived the trauma of them both being excommunicated in 1974. Then, as now, the use of contraception was forbidden. Nairi at the time had four children and had recently suffered a slight stroke. On her doctor's advice, she took the pill to avoid falling pregnant again. And because of this, she says, they were disciplined. We were shut up, what they call shut up, or put into solitary confinement, closed up in our house. They brought in this rule of, of, of no sex while you were shut up. and. Uh, <laughs> Uh, they tested us out for a week and, uh, and there's no way my husband wanted to obey that, that rule. I mean, when you're told you can't do something, those are the very things you want to do. And so um, when they came around the following week and asked, you know, have you, have you? Um, he says, no. 
but of course, uh, as soon as as soon as they were gone, I said to him, "Yeah, you, you weren't very truthful there. You should have you should have just come out with it and said yes, we did, because we had every right to." Um, so he rang them up and said, "Look, I'm sorry. I, I actually told you a lie." And uh, that was on the Monday night. By the Tuesday night, we were withdrawn from. What do you feel now, in retrospect, about this enormous interrogation you endured and the fact that a lot of it was about your sex life, your very private life? I think it's abuse. I think it's um, psychological abuse. Hi, Nari. How are you? I recognise you straight away. (laughs) Nairi Thomas wrote a book about her experience called Behind Closed Doors. Joy Nason is sharing her story for the first time. The two women met during the filming of this programme. They belong to a growing band of ex-brethren who support each other in a fellowship outside the fellowship. This support helps many ex-brethren deal with the terror they feel at stepping away from the church. It's known to those who leave as the three Fs. Everyone knows the three Fs that's been in the brethren and that's fear, families and finances. And it's, it's my belief that more people would leave, more people would have left if they weren't ruled by fear, Um, fear of the consequences of leaving, fear of divine retribution, finances, because they're very good to their members. They're very, you know, they're very generous and, and help people with money. And of course, the families, of course, you're, you're more likely to stay in if you've if you're faced with not ever seeing your family again. Nairi Thomas's family did it tough on the outside. Her two older children went to prison and one of her boys became a father at the age of 15. Her daughter had terrifying nightmares. She thought she was going to hell. She'd wake up um, crying at night time because she was going to um, into the lake of fire and get burned up. She, she um, She was eight at the time. Joy Nason's father was excommunicated late in life after years of disagreements with the Brethren leadership. His wife stayed in the church. When he tried repeatedly to contact her, he was sent a solicitor's letter telling him to stay away. He was 82 years old. Till the day of his death, he never gave up asking about my mother. Every time I would visit, he said, have you heard from her? I, he had a stroke and I rang them and told them. One of them said that he wasn't a Christian so they didn't have anything to say and hung up. But as a matter of fact, when he lay there with it, after he'd had the stroke, he was very agitated He couldn't speak, but the nurses realised he was pointing to his Bible and they put his Bible in his hand and he became very peaceful. Whatever his faults, I don't think that he should have been treated like that. And as I walked in the door after he'd had his stroke, he immediately looked beyond me to the door. I knew he thought that my mother would come and see him but she didn't. And he died a week later with no reconciliation. The exclusive Brethren told Four Corners, no one is compelled to be in the Brethren Fellowship. Children are nurtured, protected and instructed, but finally every individual has to arrive at their own conviction. The believer cannot be other than living in fidelity to his Lord and Master that some, for their own reasons, have left and become embittered and faithless to the relationship they've entered into, shows their supposed conviction was never true. The Brethren's strategy of separation is extreme, isn't it? In the spectrum of separation amongst Christian groups, it is, uh, it is extreme, yes. As the most senior leader in the church in Australia from 1976 to 1984, Ron Fawkes enacted this doctrine. You were involved in excommunicating people, weren't you? Sadly. Tell me about that. Uh, There weren't a lot of cases, um, thankfully, 
but there were cases where I was involved uh, and I make no uh, um, excuse. Uh, indeed, I, I'm ashamed, totally ashamed of, uh, of activity that I was engaged in, particularly in the area of, um, uh, of custody and access uh, cases of which I was involved in, in several. What was your aim in those cases? What were you the trying aim, to the achieve? Aim, the aim was to forbid the, uh, the person who was excommunicated or not with the brethren to have nothing to do with, uh, with his own family. Tragically for Ron Fawkes, the worm turned. And in 1984, he himself was excommunicated, he says, for speaking out against the man of God, James Symington. I had a knock on the door saying that we, um, uh, we've excommunicated you. Uh, you're not to sleep with your wife tonight. Um, I asked the reason for the excommunication. They said, you better find that out, work that out for yourself. I mean, I had a hunch, uh, but that was what I was told. What kind of organisation <clears throat> tells a husband that he can't sleep with his wife? An evil one. Did you agree to it? Did you obey it? Yeah, I did. I Why? did. Because I was just so devastated, so brainwashed, so... <laughs> just so immersed in brethren teaching and theology that I knew if ever I was going to get back, I had to do exactly what I was told. But he didn't get back, and Ron Fawkes had to leave his home, his wife and his six children behind. In a court settlement, he was promised adequate access to his children. One of the elders, who now has passed on, uh, he said that that was there to satisfy the court and that uh, I knew the score. And, of course, I, I did know the score. But you knew that it was a sham? Knew it was a sham. Total sham. Because you yourself had participated... Absolutely. ...in similar shams. Exactly. The access never happened. It's this aspect of brethren behaviour that former church members find hardest to reconcile with the fellowship's professed support for family values. I've never seen any of my children for 22 years except when I knocked on uh, one of the doors of my children and was ordered off the property. How many grandchildren have you got? I don't really know. I think at least 14. Have you ever seen them? No. Like many other Have brethren fathers who've been excommunicated, Ron Fawkes received letters from his children, but not the letters he was hoping for. I don't blame them for <laughs> the letters they wrote. They were doing the bidding of others. But uh, to Dad, I do not want to have anything to do at all with you. <clears throat> this is because you're under discipline and I stand by 2 Timothy 2, which states, everyone who names the name of the Lord withdraw from iniquity. Well, this is very sad, this one, because this is from my eldest son who is autistic and uh, no real ability to rationalise. I mean, we were very, very close. He loved me so much and I loved him. Um, to Dad, I don't want to see you because you're not right and withdrawn from and out of fellowship. Yeah. <clears throat> you still keep those letters? I do. I just love to see their handwriting. This book was produced by the Brethren, wasn't it? Yeah, I received it some years ago. I was very grateful for it because for the first time in many, many years I was able to have a look at my children. The thing that upset me actually at the time was the fact that there's no reference to me whatever. Ron Fawkes was soon written out of Brethren history. So too was his brother Phil, who says he was expelled from the church on the day he shared a drink and a snack with another person who had been excommunicated. They came around later that night and said I'd been withdrawn from and I wasn't to live with, um, or wasn't to sleep with my wife. We lived like that for a period of about three months. Um, <clears throat> I knew that all the time they were seeing my wife during the day. The priest would come while I was at work and would see her 
and were working on her, children used to let me know. This picture here is of his family, his wife, former wife, and uh, no reference to Philip. When Phil Fawkes went away on a business trip to Sydney, the Brethren came and moved his wife and family out of their home in Perth. He returned in the middle of the night to find them gone. Finally I located them and then turned up at 8 o'clock um, on the doorstep to see what had gone wrong. That's when my daughters, um, they got to me at the side window of her bedroom. They followed down and followed me down out the side window. They said, this is not what we wanted. Um, it was done against our will and uh, yeah, they, they were physically dragged. Mm. Looking back on that now, is that acceptable behaviour, to drag your daughters physically out of their home? Oh, it's totally unacceptable, totally unacceptable. There's certain things that um, I just have to live with and I accept because I've never pursued anything that is going to cause more hurt to my children than they've been to enough. So you haven't gone to court, for example? No. No, I, I could have, you know, I've paid the maintenance and done all that sort of thing, but I could not bear to see my children suffer anymore. Phil Fawkes isn't the only man to have his wife and children removed from him by church elders. This home video was made in 1992. Selwyn Wallace and his wife Julianne had both been excommunicated. She was torn between staying with him and remaining in the church, and her fellow brethren in New Zealand encouraged and helped her to move out of their home. Selwyn Wallace hired a private investigator to film the scene and help him tape phone calls between an elder and his wife. Yeah. <clears throat> It'll be inevitable that there'll be a, a separation. Yeah. What I heard almost immediately was these the elders of the church encouraging my wife to um, separate from me, um, offering to pay her legal fees, take her to see a lawyer, arrange the meetings, which they did, and uh, and telling her that the separation of the marriage was inevitable. After listening to a few, few tapes, I just decided to keep recording but not to listen to them, I was getting too angry. Selwyn Wallace faced a tough battle to persuade his wife Julianne to leave the Brethren with him. He succeeded, but even now Julianne is still too fragile to talk about it. So when three church elders came to visit him at work, his anger nearly boiled over. They wanted my wife to have custody, but they wanted to refuse me access to my children. And one of them had the audacity to say to me, we're giving you the house and the business, now we want the children. So I got my lawyer to send them a letter to tell them that my children weren't for sale. So this is the gravestone here? Yeah, that's right. I knew his mother and his brothers in the church, and uh, they, he was the, the man that they found hanging from the, the tree in the grounds of the Exclusive Brethren Church in Perth. The human cost to those who are disciplined and separated is impossible to quantify. But anecdotally, the toll of suicides is alarming. My wife's grandfather committed suicide in the church and my sister's father-in-law, my great-uncle, um, the first cousin of my mother's, and I know of two or three others. Um, about five years ago, I was asked to carry the coffin of a, a next member of that took his own life here in Perth. He was found hanging in a, in a, from a tree in the grounds of the church, the, the headquarters here in Perth. Salwyn Wallace won his battle against the church elders. He left the fellowship and took his family with him, but not before his wife Julianne had been first rewarded for her loyalty to the brethren and then threatened by an elder when she departed. When she was back in the church, she was, she was getting uh, monetary cash gifts thrown at her left, right and centre. And there was even a secret, there was a bank account opened up in somebody else's name um, because she was accepting welfare payments. 
But when Julianne told the brethren she couldn't separate from her husband, she received a dire warning. The church in Auckland said to her, if you don't return to the church, one of your children might die. It'll be God's punishment, or it'll be God speaking to you. He'll speak to you through one of your children. And then, yeah, just about four and a half years ago that we did lose our oldest son, James. He, he died at the age of 17 in his sleep. And we believe it was cardiac arrhythmia. Did your wife believe that that threat had been carried out? Um, yeah, yeah, at first she, she didn't, but then um, as parents going through the loss of a child, um, doesn't matter how strong you are, I guess, it weakens your mind. And it certainly played on her mind. Um, I guess it played on mine too for a while. Um, and I ended up having to seek medical assistance for her. Like Selwyn Wallace, Warren McAlpin comes from a family that's had its share of heartbreak. His brother Tim, he says, was excommunicated for underage drinking and died in a motorcycle accident when he was 18. I think the comments were made at the time that Tim was, was leading a worldly life outside of the Brethren and uh, this was as a result of that. In other words, that it was, if Tim hadn't left the fellowship, he wouldn't have died. That's right. Warren McAlpin was still inside the church, but in the late 1980s he fell out with the man of God, a Sydney accountant called John Hales, whose son Bruce Hales, also an accountant, is the current universal leader. He insisted on having a look at the uh, business accounts of every businessman involved in the Exclusive Brethren in Albury. I refused. I said, I've got an accountant to, to look after my books. I don't need John Ailes going through my accounts. Warren McAlpin saw the demand to look through his books as part of a continuing campaign by the Hales family to control the Brethren businesses. But his refusal to comply had him branded a troublemaker. If you question something, um, you are really an opposer. And that's what I've been labelled as since that period of time. But nothing could be further from the truth. I love these people. But the leadership under the Hales family has resulted in so much trouble and so much family breakdown and so much heartache. And it's got to stop. Warren McAlpin was excommunicated, he believes, for speaking out against John Hales. It cost him his first family and any meaningful access to his children. Warren McAlpin says the Brethren went to court repeatedly to stop him seeing his children, and that even when he won in court, the Brethren refused to comply. We are a higher court, is what they believe, and they refuse to uh, obey the courts and refuse to obey the orders that were, were set down that, that I should have access. When he did see his children, there were signs they had been indoctrinated against him. One of my boys, uh, earlier on, when he was about five or six, came to the door and spat at me and called me the devil. I now know that that was not what he was thinking. Um, as far as a hatred towards his dad. Later, like Ron Fawkes before him, his sons wrote to him. It was two registered letters from Jeremy and Richard, and I think they were eight and seven at the time. Just read me a few sentences from one of those letters. I never want to come with you again. I am eight and a half now, and I am standing on my own two feet before Jesus. Warren McAlpin is still estranged from his sons, but he did see them one more time. They were in their 20s, some 15 years later, um, but the love of a dad for his kids and the love of kids for their dad um, never ceases. It's there as strong as the day when they took the children away. Um, both boys hugged me. 
and said, you've, Dad, you don't have any bad feelings against us, do you? And I said, no, I don't have any feelings. I, in fact, I don't, I don't hate the brethren for what they've done, um, but certainly don't. I don't hold any hard feelings towards you two boys whatsoever. Most of those who've left the fellowship have continued to maintain their strong Christian beliefs. For Warren McAlpin, it involved a fresh conversion to a different kind of Christianity. It didn't involve any accountant from Sydney or a pig farmer from America or a whiskey drinking alcoholic from New York. It involved a transaction personally with Christ and that's what I took up. I have a very strong faith, indeed my faith was strengthened as a result of what I went through, which I thank God for. But um, I don't obey now because the brethren say it or anyone else says it, I obey it because God says it. Renewed faith though doesn't dull the memories or the pain. After her father was excommunicated, Joy Nason took her son to see her mother to check that she was okay and was where she wanted to be. She was behind a closed door. I just couldn't bear it. I couldn't bear that I was so close. I couldn't see her. And I suddenly remembered they always have a scripture to go by. They always have something. And it's the door, the closed door. You weren't allowed to let an ex-member through an open door. And I suddenly saw there was a fly screen and the door. And I said, Mum, if you open the door, there'll still be a closed door. And she took the bait and opened the door. And all the words of condemnation of the brethren that I was going to hurl, hurl at her just went. I just looked at her and I said, I love you, Mum. And to my amazement, she mouthed, she mouthed, I know, silently, and then said, go and get right with God, out loud, so that the people in the house would not know. I've never forgotten it. And I turned and went and took my son. These people claim to represent Christianity in its purest form. Um, but you look at the history stretching back 30 or 40 years and it's just carnage, broken families, broken lives, um, children that don't know their parents brothers and sisters that haven't seen each other for 20, 30 years, and it's all over the world. Um, and that's, that's one reason why I'm speaking today. The carnage must stop. And if we don't speak out, uh, the wheels of pain will just keep turning. <laughs>